Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. What's going on, guys? It is Saturday, September 16th, and that means it's time for the weekly recap. Before we get into that, however, if you are enjoying The Breakdown, please go subscribe to it, give it a rating, give it a review, or if you want to dive deeper into the conversation, come join us on The Breakers Discord. You can find a link in the show notes or go to bit.ly slash breakdown pod. Hello, friends. Well, as you know, I have been doing something a little bit different for the weekly recap recently. I've been collaborating with Scott Melker, the wolf of all streets, on Friday morning with a live show that we've been doing that's basically a chance to count down what we think are the most important stories and have some more editorial analysis around them. Obviously, you guys know that when it comes to the normal breakdown show, the way that I insert editorial isn't me giving my opinion on every story that comes through. Instead, it's about how I curate the breadth of different opinions, and that's what really matters to me. I want you guys to have lots of different opinions so you can make up your own minds about everything that's going through this industry. However, people have responded to having a chance to have a little bit more of that subjective, opinionated take. And so today, while Scott is in Singapore for Token 2049, I decided that I would do my own countdown. This is pretty off the cuff, I'm just letting it rip. But these are what I think are the five most important stories in reverse order. Of course, we're going to do a countdown. Let's make it a countdown. At number five, we have the Gensler hearing and his subsequent comments. So what happened? Well, there was a standard oversight hearing for the SEC this week in the Senate Banking Committee. And of course, everyone in the crypto space was waiting with bated breath to see what sound bites would be trotted out against us this time. Certainly they were there. Sherrod Brown, who's the chair of that committee, certainly used it as a chance to reinforce his view that A, crypto is bad, and that B, the SEC's enforcement record is good. And Gary's prepared testimony also had some knocks on the crypto space as well. When it came to the hearing itself, the biggest soundbite from Gensler was when he responded to Sherrod Brown, saying, right now, unfortunately, there's significant noncompliance, and it's a field which is rife with fraud, abuse, and misconduct. That was the headliner quotable that people ran with. And yet what was notable about crypto in this hearing was how little crypto there was in this hearing. Indeed, it was almost totally supplanted from the GOP as a topic of interest, instead to be something like Exhibit A in a broader case that it seems like Republicans are going to be making for the American public heading into election season, which is about the overreach of Biden appointees and government agencies in general. There was a lot of antipathy towards Gary Gensler for his refusal to comply with Republican requests for oversight. Ranking member Tim Scott, for example, called this a dereliction of Gensler's duties to the American people. And in general, it seemed like Republican members were gearing up for much bigger fights. Things like the major questions doctrine, which is a new vector for having the conversation about how much authority agencies and unelected officials can claim. Those seem like the battlegrounds that are shaping up in this pre-election season. So the reason that this hits number five at the list is not that there was something really substantive that was said. It's the fact that there wasn't, and indeed that crypto has become part of a very different narrative, which is something that given that we are just at the beginning of presidential election season, I think we're going to see a lot more of. Now, as to the question of whether crypto not being a hot button congressional issue throughout the rest of the election cycle is a good or bad thing, I think that's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Certainly, we had a pretty good chance to get some bad legislation on the books during the time when antagonism towards the industry was highest. But at the same time, you have a whole lot of people and a whole lot of companies and a whole lot of institutions that simply aren't going to touch this space with a 10-foot pole until we get some at least basic clarity. I think that if you are in that camp that wants that basic clarity, the best that you can hope for is some very targeted legislation, such as common sense stablecoin rules or something like that. Number four on our list today, we have, of course, Binance executives leaving. This was the only one that I knew had to be at this certain level, because of course, four is CZ's favorite thing to say when anyone has anything to say about Binance this year. TLDR, three executives left this week from Binance US, making the total 13 across the entire conglomerate since June. News broke on Tuesday that Binance US CEO Brian Schroeder was gone, and then on Thursday, the head of legal and the chief risk officer followed suit. Now, added to that, we have allegations from the SEC that Binance US were not cooperating with document discovery and that their wallet provider is a Binance subsidiary offshore. In other words, effectively a direct allegation from the SEC that Binance lied earlier on in the lawsuit when they said that they would not send client funds to Binance International. Now, CZ did come out and address the rumors around Brian Schroeder. He said in the tweet, There has been some speculation regarding recent management changes at Binance US. 
Brian Schroeder is taking a deserved break after accomplishing what he set out to do when he joined two years ago. Under his leadership, Binance US raised capital, improved its product and service offerings, solidified internal processes, and gained significant market share, all of which helped to build a more resilient company for the benefit of our customers. We are grateful for his contributions. Of course, the crypto world falls into basically exactly two camps. The one who followed up that post saying, thanks so much for the explanation, of course that's it. And the rest of us who are looking at it sort of shaking our heads saying, of course that's the only thing that you can say. So what's actually going on? Well, it seemed for a very long time, like Binance had basically no future in the US. It is under absolute assault from basically every regulatory angle. And regardless of what turns up, there's already been a huge impact on market share. It doesn't have access to banks, and at this moment we're seeing trading volume in the single-digit millions for 24 hours, which effectively means it's not doing anything. We've had eight months of online science from that CEO, Brian Schroeder, and so it's hard to imagine that there's any real future there. Now at the same time, it's important to remember that Binance doesn't necessarily need the US. It is still by far the biggest exchange in the world, although its market share has decreased as well, and it would be a pretty rational move at this point just to move on to greener pastures. Now, that said, it does not at all feel like the regulatory story and the investigative story around Binance is done. And while I'm certainly not rooting for them to have done bad things, because God knows this industry doesn't need another Sam, I also would like whatever's going to happen to happen so we can get on through it. Speaking of Sam, at number three, we have FTX selling approved. This has been a big emergent narrative, really more of a fear than a narrative. And the TLDR is that Galaxy Digital has been approved to start selling FTX's liquid crypto assets. FTX has about $3.4 billion worth of liquid crypto to sell, and Galaxy has been authorized to sell $50 million of that this week and next week, and then $100 million per week after that. There had been some discussion before this approval around whether people could just get their crypto back instead of it being converted to US dollars, but basically the bankruptcy estate said that that was just impossible based on how messed up things were internally at FTX. Now, why this matters is less the bankruptcy process and more about the market internalizing this deep fear that we have this big multi-billion dollar sell pressure coming right down the pipeline. Lots of people have pointed out that it's not in anyone's interest, Galaxy Digital, FTX, or any of us, for this group to just mass dump this and create negative price impact, but that hasn't stopped people from being scared. It feels to me like one of the next things we just have to get through, and frankly might correspond with another round of negative press around Sam's trial coming up next month. But if we're asking for opinions, get through it, we will. I think the pressure will be less bad than people think it will. And I think there will be a little bit of a rebound narrative when people realize that it is less bad than they anticipated. At number two, we have the SEC, but in a different context. The SEC settled their second case against an NFT project this week, that project being Stoner Cats. Now, I did a whole show about this, but basically the important things about this are one, the SEC saying its jurisdiction extends to NFTs. To the reasoning for the SEC's jurisdiction extending to NFTs, making it seem like their jurisdiction extends to your Magic Cards and your Jordans and your anything else as well. Three, for the fact that we are again seeing their strategy of going after smaller projects who have very little incentive to actually defend themselves and much more incentive to just settle and move on with their lives. And four, for the increasingly direct dissents from Hester Peirce and Mark Ueda. Now, there are a lot of pieces of that. I don't really want to go into the whole NFT and collectibles argument again. I did that on the show a couple days ago. I will only say here that I do think that overreach in this area potentially undermines SEC authority in the long run, because I don't think it's going to hold up necessarily. I think the bigger thing to watch is once again the culmination, the crescendo, if you will, and the coming endgame between this SEC and the industry. Now, of course, should the SEC be emboldened by another Democratic administration, things could just continue or even amplify, but it does kind of feel like we are at the period where most of the big shots have been fired, cases against Coinbase, cases against Binance, etc., and now they're back to trying to pick off easy targets that have implications that would lead to the accumulation of their own power. Perhaps once again, this is the reason that the GOP opponents of the SEC have decided to make the issue not crypto per se, but regulatory overreach in general, and Gensler's desire specifically to expand his personal authority and the authority of his office in ways that undermine the authority of Congress. In other words, the reason that the Stoner Cats decision gets so high on this list is not so much the Stoner Cats decision. In fact, it's not hard to find people even in the crypto community who don't really want to go out on a limb to defend Stoner Cats. Instead, it's about what it represents in terms of the cycle and where we are in the fight versus the SEC. Which leaves us with our number one, which is actually a news story that broke a week ago on Friday, which is Ripple acquiring Fortress Trust. Now, it's not really Ripple acquiring Fortress Trust that's the number one, it's what has happened subsequent to that. Specifically, 
The very brief timeline of events is that last Thursday, this was Thursday, September 7th, Fortress said that there was an incident and that all client funds were safe. On Friday, however, Ripple announced an acquisition of Fortress, which coming right after that all client funds are safe announcement certainly raised some eyebrows. And indeed, by Monday, back to this week, we found out that this was actually a bailout and that $15 million was stolen from Fortress, which was made whole by Ripple. On Wednesday, Coindesk dug up the incident report from the software partner, and it appeared that the software provider and not Fortress themselves were the ones that had the breach, although it also doesn't appear that Fortress were really abiding by the best practice security offered by that provider. On Monday, Anchorage Digital co-founder Diego Monica had discussed the issues with housing crypto custody within trust companies that may or may not have the technical expertise to do it safely. Now, it was related to the Prime Trust wallet incident, which, by the way, happened under the same watch of the guy who was running Fortress Trust, but it's certainly just as applicable here. Diego said, It is an integration failure. It is a company that did not have the technical ability to do what they're saying that they do. So you've got multiple layers of why this story matters and why it's at the number one slot. First, you have the significance of this crypto institutional consolidation. Fortress was one of very few custodians, and so seeing them get acquired by Ripple will have, well, ripple effects for the rest of the industry. Second, I think that it is reflective of the larger brittleness of crypto institutions right now coming off of the chaos of the last two years. The infrastructure for big businesses and major funds and major investors to interact with this industry is very, very bad right now. Now, of course, a lot of that is due to the fallout of things like Operation Chokepoint 2.0, where it's just getting harder and harder to be banked, for example, to get access to things like banking services and accounting services. But whatever the set of reasons, it has set back and will set back the industry. Obviously, one of the major positive trends that we have in crypto right now is the fact that major institutional players are circling around the edges, starting to wade their nose in. You've got Franklin Templeton adding their ETF application to the mix as a for example. And maybe that should be on the list as well. But it will be a significant barrier for those companies if they're not able to actually interact with these basic services like custody without having to go build it themselves. Now, the most likely outcome in my estimation is that they do, in fact, go build it themselves. That the companies who are good at all of these different parts of the traditional financial sector simply reapply that expertise to the crypto space. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if what happens and how the regulatory stuff resolves is that basically authority to do all these things is given to who the regulators perceive as the adults in the room. Another way of putting this is that in the same way that BlackRock is likely to get the first ETF, because that gives regulators the ability to say, look, we gave it to a safe party, I wouldn't be surprised if you see more and more crypto activity being managed by these storied, vaunted financial institutions that have long-term relationships with the regulators themselves. At the same time, of course, there is no crisis without opportunity. And by the end of the week, Swan had announced that they have plans to spin out a Bitcoin-only custody service. They announced that they are working with cold storage provider BitGo to develop the service, and they are planning to structure it as a trust company. Now, they are quite clear that this is a very difficult thing to do, that there is going to be a long period of getting the requisite regulatory approvals. But ultimately, I think it would be a huge boon to the ecosystem for that service to exist, especially from a service provider that Bitcoiners have built trust with. And that ultimately, that combination of reflecting where the industry is and the really low ebbs and hard points of what's happened over the last couple years, but also the fact that there are multiple paths forward, some which we might prefer to others, is why the Fortress Trust Ripple and now Swan situation makes my number one for the week. Anyways, my friends, that is going to do it for the weekly recap. Let me know what you thought of this format. Come join us on the Breakers Discord. It's a great place to talk about this. I hope you are having a great fall weekend. And until next time. Be safe and take care of each other. Peace.